is laughter and why is it important? Well, one thing you might not realise about laughter is that it's not just humans who laugh. We also observe laughter in the other great apes, so chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas, and also in rats. So laughter in all of these species, including ours, is a really important social signal. It's a way of signalling to others that we are affiliated, that we're having a nice time. If you like, it's a way of making and maintaining social bonds between people in our group. And there are lots of different ways, as humans, that we use laughter. So yes, we use laughter from early age in play contexts, when tickled by a caregiver, when playing with friends. When we get older, we use laughter with humour as well. We use laughter a lot in conversation. In fact, a lot of the time, we use laughter when we're not actually telling jokes or doing something funny, but just to smooth interactions in conversation. Someone might make a pretty boring comment about the weather, and you might find that another person with them laughs along. So it's not to say, oh, that was hilarious. It's to say, yes, I agree, we're getting on nicely. You know, I'm enjoying spending time with you. I'm really interested in researching laughter because it's a really intriguing sound that we make. It's an intriguing sound that's made in other species and it seems to have this really important function that are involved with social processes and, and social bonding. So in our study, we wanted to look at comparing the way the brain responds when you hear different types of laughter. And we wanted to do this because it really hadn't been done very extensively previously. We wanted to do this in quite a straightforward way. Let's consider real laughs, laughs when people are finding something really funny, in comparison with posed laughs or fake laughs. We got a group of participants to go into an MRI scanner and listen to a whole set of different types of sounds and we included in that real laughs compared with posed laughs that were made on demand. And what we found was when people were listening to real laughs compared with posed, they more strongly activated parts of the brain in the temporal lobes that are involved in processing sound. We think that the reason these regions were interested in real laughter is because when you really lose control when you're laughing, all sorts of extreme things can happen to your voice. It can go high in pitch, it can get wheezy, all sorts of unusual things can happen. So it makes sense that those parts of the brain might be more interested in those unusual sounds. On the other hand, when we compared regions that were more activated for posed laughter than for real laughter, we found that the listeners' brains were showing stronger activation to the posed laughter in a region in the anterior medial prefrontal cortex, that is, right here, between the hemispheres of the brain at the front of the brain. And this region has been strongly associated in other studies with a process called mentalizing, that is, trying to work out what someone else is thinking. So in our study, when people heard posed laughter, their brain was automatically trying to work out what that other person was thinking, who made that laughter that definitely sounds like a laugh, but isn't necessarily real, isn't necessarily authentic. So why is this research so interesting? Well, for me personally, I'm really, really fascinated by the human voice. I'm fascinated by all the things that we do with our voices, because we speak, we sing, and we do things like laugh and make emotional noises. And it's trying to understand not just what those sounds are, but what they mean to us as listeners and how we control the production of them as people who make noises, talkers or singers. And so this particular experiment is expanding our ideas about how we process sounds made by the voice to really ask people to consider the social importance of the voice. The voices of loved ones are extremely important to us. The voice of a parent is extremely important already to a newborn child. And all of those aspects of how we deal with voices haven't really received much attention in the scientific literature. So while the study I've described today is just one experiment, it really informs a whole programme of research that is investigating what voices mean to us, both as people listening to them and as people who own and produce them. Music